Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. On this programme today we'll be discussing the uh, natural disasters and the economic catastrophe that's currently taking place in Iran and we'll be asking could we see the end of this tyrannical regime? Shalom and uh, welcome to the programme. And my guest today is a good friend of mine and of the Middle East Report, uh, Peter Bourne. It's great to have you uh, back on the programme, Peter. Lovely to be here again, Simon. I think uh, your viewers are in for an extremely interesting programme. Absolutely. But before we, we talk about today's uh, topic, uh, could you a uh, little bit give us an update on the work you've been doing on behalf of uh, South End Friends of Israel? And of course, you're writing more as well and writing regularly for Gatestone Institute, which is a fantastic publication. And your recent article that you wrote on the proposed uh, BDS legislation in the Republic of Ireland, I use that as a basis for research for one of my programmes. So very, very impressed with the work you're doing. Good. So let me just give you an update. Uh, South and Friends of Israel have been particularly active uh, in the last few months and we have some uh, incredible um, programs coming up uh, in the future. Uh, we'll be having um, um, two speakers joining us uh, speaking about the persecution of both Christians and Jews in the Middle East, a subject matter that unfortunately gets very little media attention, although it affects millions of people worldwide. But we're certainly con be devoting a lot of time uh, and concentrating our resources uh, on that. And also it will form part of um, uh, other articles I should be writing uh, for um, several um, um, uh, online magazines, including Gatestone, and one called Weekly Blitz, which, believe it or not, is an Islamic online journal, um, but quite um, pro-Israel, let's say. Very good. And uh, Peter, in today's programme, we are discussing the major crises is that are going on. And I say crisis because there's many of them in the Islamic Republic of Iran. But um, it was only back in February that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, celebrated 40 years since its revolution and the overthrow of the Shah. Um, what is the legacy of the Iranian revolutionary from the, during the past 40 years? Um, Iran is was and still is a split society. The uneducated uh, of the Iranian regime naturally are dictated to and follow the totalitarian theocracy of the mullahs. And that is their client base, that is their strength. Within Iran, even to this day, there is a highly educated middle class who militarily don't have the power uh, to challenge the mullahs who run the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, from which most of the uneducated um, come from. So the legacy is one that it's um, a compromise between a rabidly obsessed Islamic theocracy and a middle class that is trying to do its best to maintain some kind of living for their families still within Iran. Although it must be said, Simon, that many of that genre that I've mentioned uh, have left and now form part of the Iranian diaspora, trying so hard to challenge this um, uh, the, the mullahs in, in, in Iran. 
And, and if we look back at the past 40 years, uh, you know, what, what has the UN regime done? Well, it is now the biggest sponsor of international terrorism throughout the world, sponsoring terror organizations like no. Hezbollah, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. It also cooperated and worked with Al-Qaeda and has international terror networks throughout the world. Um, they're also on the verge of trying to build a nuclear weapons program, have the most appalling human rights record and want to subject and control and dominate the entire Middle East as well uh, as threatening to, to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. It doesn't matter who the Prime Minister is, it's the Supreme Leader Homini who holds all the power. Um, when, we, when we look at this, do you think the Iranian revolutionary is on the verge of fulfilling its dreams and aspirations in trying to establish the Islamic crescent? Because currently they are dominating Iraq, Syria, um, Yemen, Lebanon, uh, and also propping up uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria, which means that Iran, outside of Israel, is the strongest and most dominant power in the region. Uh, you're absolutely correct in that, an that analysis. So let's step back a bit. When the uh, Iranian regime came to power some 40 years ago, um, it took quite some time to build up militarily and politically to where it is currently. And as you so rightly suggested, they sponsor terrorism uh, throughout that region. Uh, the Houthis in Yemen that have absolutely devastated that country. Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hamas in Gaza. Uh, the Assad regime in uh, in, 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 in Syria as well. And they have contrived over the years to create an Iranian, or tried to contrive an Iranian dominated presence that to date has been successful. And one of the re driving factors for that was the flexibility that the Obama regime gave the Iranians in trying to come to some um, agreement or limitation on them producing their nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, as we have seen, um, Obama was not, um, didn't play his ha the, the, a good hand in that particular case. And frankly, the Iranians were just mocking the Americans. Uh, the Trump administration, politically, I think, has played a much better poker hand and has done quite a good job in limiting um, Iranians' expansionist plans. But domestically, Iran is facing problems too, Simon. The Iranians are actually fed up with the amount of time, effort, money and resource that the theocracy is pouring into some of the regimes we've just mentioned to the detriment of Iranians internally. And as we'll discuss later on in the programme, we can see how that's played out. So let's have a look at uh, this uh, announcement by the US government about the Iranian regime actually supplying sophisticated and advanced weapons to uh, regimes that it favours in the Middle East as well as uh, terror organisations across the region. From AK-47 ripoffs and rocket-propelled grenade launchers to sniper rifles and heavy artillery, fresh evidence, the United States says, of Iran's efforts to spread its malign influence. The Iranian threat is growing, and we are accumulating risk of escalation in the region if we fail to act. According to U.S. Special Representative for Iran, Brian Hook, nowhere has the threat been more alarming than in Yemen, where Iran's support of Houthi rebels has enabled them to repeatedly fire short-range ballistic missiles into Saudi Arabia. Pointing to the evidence now on display, U.S. defense officials say it's just the start. It's not just Saudi and Yemen, but it's a story of how uh, Iran is proliferating uh, these various uh, weapon systems across the region and destabilizing the region. That includes Shia militias in Bahrain and Afghanistan and Pakistan, where Iranian small arms and rockets have made their way to the Taliban. U.S. defense officials say there are a number of telltale indicators that link these weapons, like this machine gun variant, directly and conclusively to Iran.
everything from the serial number to the reddish brown synthetic material used for the stock. Stamps that show that it belongs to uh, Iranian defense industry, that there may be Farsi markings. This is not the first time Iran's leaders have faced such accusations. In turn, charging it is the U.S. that is lying to cover up for a disastrous war in Yemen. A charge Hook denies. I haven't heard anybody say this is a political stunt. Uh, this is simply putting out in broad daylight um, Iran's uh, missiles and small arms and rockets and UAVs and drones. Still in question whether this latest U.S. push to highlight the spread of Iranian military hardware will change anyone's mind about Iran's regional rival, Saudi Arabia, under fire in Washington and around the world for the death of U.S.-based journalist Jamal Khashoggi. I get Yemen. I understand the strategic, the strategic relationship between us and Saudi Arabia, but I'm not going to blow past this. For now, the U.S. hopes the world will at least take a look at what it maintains is an Iranian smoking gun. Jeff Selden, VOA News, Washington. And it's good to see that the Americans are dealing with the Iranian threat in the Middle East. Um, Peter, I mean, we have to, to mention the fact that uh, throughout the 40 years of the Islamic Revolution that the Iranian regime has constantly questioned Israel's legitimacy as a state, constantly threatened to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Um, and uh, over 10 years ago, when President Ahmadinejad was in power, constantly said he was going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, together with actually putting on conferences such as a world without Zion, and also holding conferences that denied the Holocaust took place. And we've seen this constant um, hatred directed of it from Israel, at Israel, from the supreme leader of Iran, Khomeini. Um, it's Israel's biggest threat, isn't it? The Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, I would have said it certainly was, but dynamics seem to be changing, Simon, somewhat. And let, let me just elaborate and uh, uh, allow me to perhaps educate some of your viewers of, of what's, what's going on at the moment. Um, what, at the core of Iranian expansionism plans was to assist and prop up the Assad regime in Syria. Um, and to some extent, Iran has been incredibly successful um, in devoting manpower and resources to ensuring that Assad stays in power, along with the Russians. Now, it was the Iranians that put in the manpower, huge amounts of money, in order to achieve um, not only economic benefits, but also military benefits, which would undoubtedly have been a huge threat to Israel. But geopolitics, geopolitics is a very strange beast, Simon. And what we've seen in the last few months is the following. Um, for people like myself that follow this situation virtually well, on a daily basis, we have seen numerous occasions where Israel has bombed Iranian infrastructure and troops located in Syria. It has bombed weapons convoys um, from Iran into Syria too. And incredibly, the Russians, apparently an, a so-called ally of Iran, in the help to prop up of Assad, have allowed this to happen. Very recently, we've even seen Iranian and Russian troops um, fight each other. We've seen Netanyahu visit Putin on several occasions, and we know that there's a hotline to Putin put in after a very, um, uh, almost a disastrous um, Israeli raid which actually killed Russian troops. Now there's no doubt in my mind and in the mind of many of the political analysts who, who follow this that Russia has absolutely no desire to allow Iran to expand any further than it has done. Russia wants the economic 
benefits of propping up the, Sada the Assad regime and not Iran. And Russia is trying very, very hard, and successfully so, to limit Iran's expansionist plans by allowing uh, Israel to militarily halt uh, Iran's military uh, occupation as well. So what could have been one of the, or the biggest threat to Israel, um, i.e. Iranian troops in Syria, through Russia's political uh, skill and Israel's um, never, well, Israel will not allow uh, Iran uh, military dominance. I'm afraid that I Iran, having spent lots of manpower, don't forget they've lost troops fighting uh, to prop up Assad, they've put in huge amounts of money and military equipment, and frankly, it's come to nothing. And I've read recently that as far as the Syrian ports are concerned, it is Russia and not Iran that is being allowed 50-year uh, leases on the ports. And that's one of the main reasons why um, Putin decided to get involved and intervene in the uh, conflict uh, in the Syrian civil war to back up uh, President Bashar al-Assad's regime in order to have uh, a, a port on the Mediterranean. That's absolutely right, but how clever of Russia to allow Iran to use its troops and manpower whilst Russia, which has put in troops as well, but not use them in virtually in the conflict zones, and has reaped the benefits of that. And uh, currently the, uh, the Iranian economy is being affected very heavily uh, by sanctions put in place by uh, President Trump's administration. So now let's have a look at uh, this excellent video produced by the Israeli Foreign Ministry that looks at where all the money goes. And uh, why should the Iranian people suffer because the hands of their failed leadership with the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran? Um, Peter, wh when we look at the economic situation uh, facing uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, it looks very precarious. Um, back in 2012, the regime itself was on the verge of economic collapse, uh, reached out to the uh, Obama administration and, in term and for billions in sanctions relief actually cooperated with what was known as the Iran deal to um, uh, just halt or temporarily stop the process of, uh, of building their nuclear weapons program. Um, how has President Obama's administration assisted and helped the Iranian regime? Um, the amount of funds that Obama put into Iran allowed the Iranians to continue with their nuclear program, continue to support terrorism, uh, to continue the propaganda campaigns against Israel um, all, all over the world. And it gave them a stay of execution for about three years, I would say. Um, I, for the life of me and other analysts, we don't understand the uh, dynamics driving uh, Obama's um, flexibility with the biggest sponsor of terrorism, a country that hates uh, the United States of 
of America and would, do, would have done anything in its power to see the, any US administration fall. And yet Obama, maybe for um, an anti-Israel um, political view, uh, put billions of dollars into the Iranian regime right at the end of his uh, administration. An absolute disaster, a very poor policy decision for which um, many people in the Middle East uh, w were persecuted as a result of um, the, the Iranians having sufficient funds to allow them to continue on that, on that, on that policy. I mean, there's a few uh, American congressmen who've um, expressed real concern um, about how the Obama administration, and particular President Obama's decision um, to stop an FBI investigation um, that would have brought to trial and arrest Hezbollah operatives who were in the United States who were raising billions of uh, dollars for the regime in drug smuggling and gun running and other criminal activity were let off the hook and the investigation was stopped because President Obama feared that this would upset the Iranians and would derail um, his Iranian plan and his Iranian deal, which is his only legacy of his uh, eight years in office as US president. Um, why is he not being prosecuted? Why indeed. Um there will be a judgment day. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Um, at the moment, I think the Trump administration are doing such a good job in uh, not only um, putting back all the um, Obama policies that so helped the Iranian regime and so encouraged the drug smugglers of Hezbollah that I think that um, um, legal prosecution, especially with what uh, Donald Trump has got going on internally anyway with the Mueller report, is probably and will be hopefully in the second term of his administration. I, think we, I don't think we'll see it uh, at, at this stage. Um, Hezbollah's drug smuggling activities, I think I read a report recently, Simon, that um, they are, uh, thanks to the Venezuelan connection, which is also uh, fortunately uh, falling apart, but they are the biggest um, organised crime syndicate when it comes to uh, uh, heroin and, uh, and cocaine. Quite, quite incredible. So let's have a look at uh, this uh, video which puts uh, Obama under the spotlight for his appeasement of Hezbollah. And it's uh, time that the Obama administration and those officials working high up in his administration face a prosecution and an investigation for their collaboration in support of terrorism with overlooking the activities of uh, Hezbollah. Um, extraordinary. When you look at the, the attack against President Obama, and sorry, with the attack against President Trump, um, uh, uh, ever since he, he kind of merged as the leading uh, Republican candidate for president, um, the, his enemies 
uh, in the in the Democrat Party have been accusing him of coercion with the uh, with the Russians, with President Putin, um, and yet here we have the Obama administration effectively turning a blind eye to billions of money being raised for the Iranian regime and terrorism around the world, uh, and surely this needs justice and prosecution. Well, as I said before, Sam, I think Judgment Day will come. But there are so many things going on um, in the next um, two years of the Trump administration that I think legally prosecuting uh, those former members of the Obama administration will take place as and when Donald Trump gets a second term in office, which is what people who are pro-Israel supporters are, are, are hoping uh, will be. Um, the uh, other thing that's going on at the moment, Simon, is that the domestically, uh, Iran um, is facing huge problems because of the e dire economic situation that we spoke about and because of the natural disasters that have, uh, uh, had, have an Im had an impact on the country. So, um, yes, I think Obama and the various members of his uh, Foreign Policy Affairs Committee um, will face the music, but I don't see that happening uh, in the last couple of years of uh, Donald Trump's administration. And uh, President Trump's uh, first year in office back in uh, 2017, one of his first action um, was actually to recede uh, the Iran deal and to actually cancel it. Um, what impact has that had on Iran and what impact has the reinstatement of sanctions against the regime had on the regime itself and its economy? Okay, the um, sanctions have had a devastating effect um, uh, but that's only part of the story, as I'll, as I'll allude to shortly. Um, the Iranian rial um, was the official rate, 35,000 rials to the dollar. It's now uh, anywhere between 160 and 200,000 rials on the dollar. What does that actually mean, Simon? If I can just give a, an example, it means that one toilet roll in Iran uh, costs the equivalent of 17 times that in paper uh, rials just to buy one, one toilet roll. The economy is disastrous. A barter is the currency now. Um, it's, it's actually um, mimicking um, what's happened in Venezuela with the collapse of the Venezuelan Bolivar. The, the real is absolutely worthless at the moment and the and sanctions have played a major part in that. But another part of that has been the um, the disasters, the natural disasters that have befallen the country, and that's something that no human uh, could have uh, implemented. Uh, all the military policies, all the economic sanctions, um, all the opposition which has um, befallen Iran in the, in the last two or three years has been only part of the story. The major impact on the Iranian uh, economy going so poorly, um, being so devastated, has been the um, earthquakes, bird flu and flooding that has severely damaged the country. Uh, and before we talk about these uh, incredible natural disasters, um, can we talk a little bit about how have the Iranian people themselves been suffering um, because of the regime's policies to support and um, prop up President As uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria, together with sponsoring and supporting um, terrorism around the world, uh, it's had a devastating impact on Iranian society. So how are, are ordinary Iranians feeling under the incredible sanctions that are, that are really gripping the country right now? You're so right. And in fact, uh, what we don't see in our media, unfortunately, but what is being generally reported are the number of um, domestic um, uh, uprisings that are happening not only in all the major cities in Iran, in Iran but in the countryside as well. Um, we, the Iranian authorities do a very good job on limiting the amount of output that gets bravely smuggled out by um, Iranian opposition groups and one can see um, towns, uh, um, people um, 
revolting in towns, cars set alight, um, Iranian revolutionary guards um, fighting in the streets, just similar to the Paris uh, riots that we've seen with the, uh, the yellow vest. It's happening all the time in Iran as opposition groups are so sick of the um, regime supporting economically the uh, terrorist groups that you've just spoken about, Hamas, Houthis, Hezbollah, the Assad regime, to the detriment of their own economy, which is going through such appalling times at the moment. So it wouldn't surprise me if these um, uh, groups, these opposition groups, grow in number, get more confident in number. Um, we know that there are certain parts of the military that perhaps um, haven't made the jump from uh, A to B, but certainly uh, could do if these opposition groups get the backing and the support domestically. So let's have a look now at this uh, very brave and courageous uh, woman in Iran's parliament standing up to the regime for its political uh, oppression and support for terrorism around the world. ملی پول ما بی ارزشترین واحد های پول دنیا است گرانی رانت احتکار و فساد بیداد می کند از نظر اجتماعی بیکاری فقر فحشا نبود آزادی های اجتماعی از جمله بازداشت بازداشت فعالان مدنی و سنفی به طور روزمره دیده می شود دانشجویان و کلا معلمان کارگران فعالان زن فعالان زیست محیطی در حبس و حصر و ستاره دار شدن قرار دارند بی احترامی به قانون عدم اعتماد اجتماعی خشونت گسترده بحران ها و آلودگی های زیست محیطی را شاهد هستیم ورود نیروهای نظامی به عرصه سیاست اقتصاد و فرهنگ حال رئیس جمهور بگویند بحران نداریم جناب رئیس جمهور فعلا با ابرچالش ها درگیر هستیم و همه میدانند وابسته نگه داشتن دهان منتقدان اثری از جمهوریت باقی نمانده و با فساد و احکام ناعادلانه قضایی مدینه فاضلی اسلامی که آرزوی آن را داشتیم نهادینه نکردیم و اما میخواستم به قوه قضایی که پایه ادالت جمهوریت و آزادی جامعه است انتقاد کنم و ناکارآمدی و ناتوانی آن را گوش زد کنم اما دریغ از گوش شنوا میخواستم رئیس جمهور و دولت را نقد کنم و گلایه های به حق مردم را بیان کنم و نارضایتی جدی مردم را بگویم دیدم ایشان در بین گزینه های نظارت استثوابی بهتر, بهتر به نظر می رسید و در همین مجلس ایشان به بهانه توصیه های رهبری پاسخ های قانع کننده ای به ملت و نمایندگان ندادند میخواستم از نهادهای نظامی و شف نظامی و حضور همه جانبه آنها در امور کشور انتقاد کنم ولی مگر می شود به گروهی که سگانه قدرت ثروت و نیروی نظامی را با هم دارد اعتراض کرد میخواستم از صدا و سیما انتقاد کنم دیدم که آنها خود را بسیار فراتر از پاسخگویی به ملت و نمایندگان میداند میخواستم همچون گذشته برای تزلم خواهی به روحانیت حامی مردم رجوع کنم به آنها شکایت ببرم اما متاسفانه دقدقه امروز برخی روحانیون ما به جای آنکه فقر و فساد و دینگریزی جوانان و اختلاس از بیت المال باشد درگیر تارموی زنان و دوچرخ سواری آنان است به خدا پناه میبرم و خطابم را مقام رهبری قرار میدهم زیرا اعتقاد دارم که تنها راه برون رفت از ابرچالش های فعلی ورود رهبری برای نجات کشور است نهادهای نظامی به پادگان ها برگشته و به وظایف ذاتی خود بپردازند تا 
اقتصاد و فرهنگ سامان بگیرد ارائه راهکارهای حمایتی برای طبقات فرود است تا برخورداری کامل آنان از شوق مسکن درآمد و زندگی آبرومند آزادی محصورین موسوی کروبی و زهرا رهنورد آزادی زندانیان سیاسی و عفو آنها و اعلام عفو عمومی برای بازگشت هموطنان And what you have to understand there is that the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, um, led by the Supreme Leader Khomeini, is uh, an, an authoritarian regime. So to have a, a, a female MP standing up with the bravery and the courage to speak against the regime um, is pretty much unheard of in Iran. Um, Peter, now we're getting on to probably the most exciting uh, part of the program. And again, this is where we see the fulfillment of Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 come into being and actually shaping world history, being the, the cause for the rise and fall of empires, that I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those mm. who curse you. Now, it almost seems as if Iran has been hit by a perfect storm. We, we discussed the economic crisis that is affecting ordinary Iranians and is affecting the Iranian regime, but it's the natural disasters that are having a big impact. First the earthquake, then the bird flu, and now this um, severe flooding that out, that out of uh, uh, 25 provinces uh, um, have been affected with crop failure, with flooding, towns being destroyed, uh, and the situation is um, a grave humanitarian uh, situation. So why are we not hearing any of this on our on mainstream news? Because it's a disaster on such a huge scale. Yeah, it's such a great question, Simon. Uh, why not? Why not indeed? So let's just uh, take a moment to pause and reflect on what's happening um, with uh, the, the Iran and the, and the people of Iran. Uh, as we said before, um, the Trump administration has thankfully undone all the damage that the Obama administration put in at the end of his, uh, um, of his term as president. We've seen Iranian expansionist plans in Yemen, in Syria, uh, in, in Lebanon um, and uh, Hamas in, in, and back in Hamas in Gaza. And we've seen opposition groups in Iran so bravely trying to counter the totalitarian theocracy of the uh, Khomeini regime. Nothing has devastated Iran so much as the very recent natural disasters that have befallen that country in the last two years. Starting with the 2017 earthquake on the Iran-Iraq border, no one knows the actual death toll of um, people. What we do know is that all the uh, homes and businesses and buildings that were destroyed in that devastating earthquake to this day have not been rebuilt or repaired. The Iranians, however, and let me go back to it again, have put in millions to supporting terrorist groups rather than funding domestically the damage done by the earthquake. If that wasn't bad enough, uh, Iran depends hugely on internal agriculture and food produce, not having the foreign currency to import um, as they did when the Shah was in power, for example. And in uh, the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, there was a, an, a bird flu outbreak, and I think somewhere between 30 and 50 million uh, chickens were, had to be destroyed because of the devastating outbreak. And that had a huge impact on ordinary people and uh, their lives. Now, more recently, we've had the most devastating floods that anyone can remember in any country since time immemorial. We've had, I think I've got this right, Simon, nearly a thousand bridges destroyed, roads uh, beyond repair, oil pipelines damaged, airports um, 
put in, internal and, and main airports put out of um, use. Um, thousands, thousands of people were displaced and we don't know the, the death toll. And yet, Simon, although this has been going on for a month, apart from some online information that you would have to really try hard to find, nothing has been forthcoming in our mainstream media. Now, why is this? Well, part of it is because the Iranians are very good at uh, stopping such output getting out, but they aren't that good. And it seems to me that our um, media in Europe have been totally ignoring this story in the hope and expectation that maybe it will all die down and the um, problems that this will expose about the lack of support the Iranian government give to their own populace will, uh, will, will get out. It would be a propaganda coup for those in the Iranian opposition if this story were to be exposed by the mainstream media. Politicians aren't talking about it. The country's been devastated. Um, the cost of repair, even if there was no further damage, is expected to be something like 7.5 billion US dollars. The Iranians can't even afford a million dollars to put this right. Extraordinary, isn't it? Um, but also what shocks me is that We've seen recent uh, disasters in uh, Nepal, you know, with the earthquake, and we've seen other similar disasters around the world in recent years in which there's been huge kind of media coverage on these. Now, the fact is that this has affected 25 provinces out of 31 provinces in Iran. It, it's led to um, towns and villages being underwater. It's led to houses and crops and infrastructure being destroyed. Uh, and yet there's no coverage whatsoever on this huge event that's taken place in Iran as well. Uh, and our hearts also go out to the Iranian people suffering under the misery of these natural disasters, which it very much seems as if the plagues that affected Egypt um, during uh, the time of, of Moses uh, are similar disasters that are affecting the nation of Iran, which is proving that if you come against the nation of Israel, God's people, then the God of Israel comes against you. This is what we're seeing in history now, isn't it? I truly believe that to be the case. Um, the Iranian economy was um, going through a appalling, uh, an appalling situation prior to these natural disasters, which have just exacerbated the situation and clearly, there is more going on than the, the likes of you and I can dare imagine. Spiritually, um, the Iranian people are coming up against their, uh, I I Israel's uh, main support um, from a uh, non-military presence, let's say. Um, and it is envisaged that these current floods are set to continue and indeed get worse. How the Iranian people domestically are going to challenge this, one can only speculate, but it wouldn't surprise me if at some stage the opposition to this totalitarian theocracy that has so mismanaged the country domestically and is playing such dangerous games externally is going to face internal opposition, which one hopes will see the start of the fall of this regime. Uh, and could we see the start of the fall of the regime? I mean, only a few years ago, this the, the fall of the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran and its uh, totalitarian regime would be absolutely unthinkable. Um, but everything you've suggested today seems that this could be extremely possible, particularly now with the natural disasters. Um, we know that the opposition is heavily oppressed by Iran's military forces. So what will it take for the Iranian people then to rise up again and demand their freedom and demand their liberty against such evil regime. Well, actually, we're already seeing it, Simon. The, um, the regime banks on the military might of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, who have been held in such low esteem by the general populace. They want to see the Iranian Revolutionary Guard 
supporting people domestically, clearing roads, re re rebuilding airports, uh, repairing pipelines. They don't want to see their sons fighting um, on behalf of uh, President Assad of Syria or on the Houthis in Yemen or propping up Hezbollah in Lebanon. And the reports that are coming out, those, uh, those brave people who are get, managing to get out reports, are already th um, telling us that when the Iranian Revolutionary Guards go in to assist in townships, they are being uh, coerced to leave the mullahs to rather like what's happening with uh, in Venezuela, where at the moment uh, Maduro still has control of part of the military, but a great part is moving over. And I think we're going to witness the same thing uh, in Iran. Yeah. Also, what we're seeing in Iran as well, which is very important to our viewers as well, is the incredible persecution against uh, Christians in Iran, um, to the extent that they are one of the most persecuted peoples across the entire planet. Not only that, but also because of the oppression and because of the, the breakup of uh, the Iranian society, um, that many Iranians are becoming Christians who are then be having a tremendous love for Israel. So the future for Iran could look bright if uh, some brave and courageous people can take their helms uh, and steer Iran in a completely different direction. Uh, because we have to realise that prior to 1979 and prior to the Islamic Revolution, Israel's most strongest ally in the Middle East was Iran. Yeah, and many of us can see that situation repeating itself we may only be one or two years away from it uh, if Mr. Trump um, gets a second term in office. We may see this happen quicker than even we had hoped for. Uh, but we pray for the Iranian people Absolutely. who are suffering under this totalitarian theocracy for the Christians in Iran, as you say, why don't they get any media coverage? I can't remember a programme being devoted to the persecution of Christians in that part of the world. And, and also, uh, Peter, it's also important to discuss the small Jewish community in Iran that, that face uh, real difficulties um, under the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Very small, very under the radar. I believe there's one Jewish Iranian M MP but one can imagine, Simon, that living under such uh, a government, uh, it's very difficult for people like that to put their head above the parapet. And they are secretly hoping that, um, along with the other opposition groups and what's happening in the country domestically, that the time of this religious uh, dominance is going to fall. Um, and we think it's going to, we hope it's going to be quicker than anyone had dared expected uh, two years, two or three years ago when the Iranians went on their military expansionism plans. And it's also important to remember that the kind of founding father of the Iranian people was King Cyrus, who allowed the Jewish people to return back to the Holy Land to rebuild the temple after its destruction by Babylon. Uh, could we see an extent with a new regime in place where we see that uh, one of Israel's closest allies again could be uh, the Iranian people? There is no Iranian doubt, nations. there is absolutely no doubt in my mind about that and when I uh, have meetings and talk with various um, Iranian opposition groups in the diaspora this is the their aim and objective and what they pray for every day of the week absolutely uh, and, and finally Peter for those um, of our viewers living in Essex uh, and they want to get involved with Israel how can they get involved with South End Friends of Israel uh, South End Friends of Israel <coughs> have a very very good Facebook page and website so um, and my email is on there so please anyone who's interested uh, just go onto our Facebook page or email me and we'd be absolutely delighted to uh, tell you of our forthcoming events. Excellent. And um, the issues that we've discussed on today's programme, um, have you written any articles for Gatestone Institute or other publications that our viewers can? Yes, indeed. Um, uh, 
more recently a publication called Decisive Liberty and Weekly Blitz. The articles that I've written for Gatestone, uh, strangely enough, have been on the island programme, which on, on the island policy, which uh, you had with Stephen Yaffe just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Excellent. Uh, Peter, thank you for being my guest on today's Middle East Report. And I want to thank you for watching today's programme. We've really got to pray for the people of Iran and also pray that this oppressive, uh, tyrannical regime in Iran collapses so that the Iranian people can be free and uh, and that is what everyone wants across the Middle East and across the world so so we leave you with this song uh, which is dedicated to the people of Iran suffering under these horrific natural disasters um, and also suffering because of the mismanagement of the Islamic Republic of Iran ساعت هنوز مردم و معمولان غذای آب هیچی نرسیده آره هنوز نان خالی هم هیچی نرسیده گفتن بیمارستان صحرایی دایر کردیم من همین الان از بچه های درمان پرسیدم گفتن آجا دارومون هم دیگه تمامه ستاد بوران و پلوتر خودش هاد بوران و سلام نه فرمان دار نه اوستان دار نه حلال نه حلال امری وجود نواره همه شایه فقط شایه تقسیم شادر کجاست؟ نه باقر کجاست؟ هیچ مدیدی از این نیست